we will begin, like I said, we're going to talk about generational curses. Uh, I'm going to get to a short part about familiar spirits, and it's not on your handout, so when we get to that, you may want to at least write down some verses. Uh, but predominantly, we're going to be talking about generational curses. What are they? You know, well, we all know what the word generation means. We all know, you know, just thinking about <coughs> grandparents, parents, ourselves, our children, you know, those are all generational generations. So we have an understanding of generational, but then when you tie in this word curses, you're like, okay, let me take a step back and, and, and try to absorb this and understand it, that how is it that there can be um, curses on our families that can go from generation to generation. Um, it happens. I mean, the Word of God even talks about it. Um, but the body of Christ is, you know, as, as a whole, um, has very little understanding about that. You know, even as believers, as Christians, you know, we are walking with the Lord, we're trying to follow God's Word, but it's not, but it's kind of like sometimes we think, why is this like a black cloud over me? And I don't understand it, and I don't understand why, even as a Christian, why there are some things happening in my life. I don't know if anybody's been there, but I was there one time. And a lot of that was just the lack of knowledge, the lack of understanding. And so hopefully as we go these next few weeks, we're going to have a better understanding. Why? Because I believe the Lord wants you to understand the deeper things of God, but also to understand your enemy. You know, how is all of this happening? Why is all of this happening? Well, the Lord talked about it in the Old Testament about generational curses and so forth. And so God was very aware that mankind was going to be dealing with these issues. The problem is, is that the church over the years, many years, has tried to suppress it, keep it quiet, keep it silent, let's not talk about those things. And so the Christians are walking with the Lord, and yet they're thinking, why am I having these struggles? And yet, little did we know that it could possibly be something be back from, from great-grandma, great-grandpa, or something like that, and we had no knowledge or understanding. And that's what... We're going to be talking about these next few weeks that I hope and pray that everybody does have a better understanding. And of course, how can we break those generational curses? How can we, as all of us in this room right now, how can we break them so they will not carry forth to our children, they will not carry forth to our grandchildren and great-grandchildren down the line? Um, and so we're going to start uh, talking about this tonight. Well, let me say something. Okay, go ahead. You know, we talk about generational curses, and it's easy to say it could have been from my grandfather or, you know, great grandfather. But they also can begin in your generation, too. If you have a habit, you can create a curse that goes down to your children and your grandchildren. And that's why I think it's so important that each of us should break curses over us in Jesus' name. Yes. One of the things I do want to stress, and I'm glad you, you paused on that because it reminded me of something the Lord wanted me to share. We all know that Jesus became the curse for us on the cross, correct? There's no denying that He became the curse for us. That is why we can be delivered from generational curses. Now, I say that, though, also to say this. Yes, Jesus became the curse for us because it said, Cursed is he who hung on a tree. Well, of course, the, all the curses, not only the sins, sickness, disease, all of that, you know, even the curses went upon Jesus. However, here's the thing. You know, Jesus died for sin, too, right? So he's the Savior of the world. But... Unless we accept that, unless we tap into that and, and say, Jesus, I need you as my Lord and Savior because I am a, a sinner and I need a Savior. It's there. But not everybody has reached out to grab hold of that. Same thing with curses. Jesus died to take the curses upon himself. But if someone is not saying, okay, Jesus, because you became the curse. I don't have to have carry the curse. If they don't know that and they're not grabbing hold of that, they're not taking advantage of that blessing of God. Everybody understand that? Because I want to make sure, you know, some, someone doesn't misunderstand and say, but I thought Jesus became the curse for us. He absolutely did. Praise the Lord for that. 
He took the curse. He took the curse for cancer. He took the curse for, for the habitual sins and, and things like that that mankind uh, does. But, but we have to receive the, you know, the, the blessing instead of the cursing. And so that's why a lot of people are still, in a sense, walking under curses because they've never reached out to receive the blessings of the Lord to cover them and protect them from the curses. So we, have, we all have a good understanding of that. I want to make sure that, that there is no misunderstanding on that particular thing. All right, so what is sin? You know, sin is more than just unwise behavior that produces sorrow and distress. It is rebellion against God. It is the breaking of God's law and instruction through disobedience. Because let's just face it, sin is disobedience of God's word. Okay? To some people, they don't think that because if they don't, if they don't believe in the word of God, if they don't follow the word of God, they don't think they're sinning. They just think, hey, I'm doing what I'm doing because I want to. But sin for you and I is what it is. It's disobedience against God's word. We have been given the law. We have been given the word of God. Therefore, what? God holds us accountable. I've given you this. My word says what I want you to do and what I don't want you to do. And the path that I have for you. But we need to be following this. So, you know, technically, do we have an excuse to... For habitual sins, intentional sins? No, we don't. Because we have the Word of God that tells us what is right and what is wrong. And, you know, doing the study even back to the Old Testament, you know, what, how many commandments did they have back in the Old Testament? 613. 613 do's and don'ts. Mankind could never, never be faithful to, you know, those 613. It just couldn't. That's why Jesus had to come. Now, when Jesus came, by that time, you know, the the, the, the uh, Jewish leaders had added some in, so then it ended up being like 630-something when you add the man's, you know, do's and don'ts in there to the 613. So mankind could never, ever, you know, be faithful up to either do or be faithful to don't. And so Jesus had to come. And so sin is more than just unwise behavior. What is a curse? A curse is the penalty to be paid for the breaking of the law. The biblical meaning is the consequence that will occur because of disobedience and rebellion against God's law. And what is a pattern? A pattern is a sequence of evidences of behaviors that is repeated. All right. Now, as Christians, you know, you probably heard that saying, well, it's just a little white lie. I just said a lie. I'm not over here murdering somebody or robbing banks. I'm just telling a little lie. Is there, is there a, this is okay, but this isn't? No. But mankind has said, society has said, well, it's just Lie. After all, I didn't want to hurt their feelings, so I said, it's okay to lie. I didn't want to get in trouble, and that's okay. But oh my gosh, those people over there that murdered somebody and the drug dealer and all this, you know. Oh, oh. Society and even the body of Christ, unfortunately, has dictated and decided what is acceptable and what is not. And so, but in God's eyes, what is God? Like? Sin, sin, sin. Is sin. Sin is sin. You know, even in today's society, what's the big thing right now that, that, that is in an uproar in today's society? Of course, it's what? Homosexuality is one. Okay? Uh, a lot of it is pride. That's another one that's rising up. And self-will and self-desire and self-satisfaction. All that's out there, too. Greed. Oh, my goodness. All that out there. But yet, when you really stop and think about it, is there any difference between a lie and someone who is living a life of homosexuality? No, sin is sin. Okay, but society says, I don't accept you. But yeah, it's okay, you can come to church even though you might tell a lie. But no, you can't come to church because you're doing that. And so, even all of this I'm saying because we've got to start breaking things down. We've got to start really 
really realizing sin, generational curses, familiar spirits, all these different things that are going on, and the body of Christ is it needs to kind of be awakened in a sense to know truth, the truth of God's word, obviously, because that's what we are to, to uh, put anything up against, anything going on in this world, in society, in our lives, and all that. What does the word of God say about it? And so, you know, it's about changing the attitude of the heart, too, because I, I have to love that person, even a person that might have killed a child or something. And, and you know, I, I can't I can't say, well, that is unacceptable. But over here you might have somebody who's watching pornography or something on their computer at home and sleeping. You know, and I think I'm getting the point across that that the body of Christ has got to 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 uh, open up themselves or expand themselves to say, Jesus, how do you see people? How do you see people? And so for me, my sin, my sin, your sin, whatever, in God's eyes, sin is sin. And so it's all part of what we're going to be breaking down in these next few weeks. Okay? Note, the longer we debate the temptation, the more likely it is that we will give in to sin. Is that a true statement? You bet it is. Because that's even what, that's what's even going to be when we start covering and talking about this. Because sin is where Satan comes to tempt you. He's thrown it out there and he's tugging and he's tugging and he's tugging. Come on, grab it, grab it. And what are we supposed to be doing? Nope, we're supposed to be swimming by and saying, nope, uh-uh, that's going to get me in trouble. That's going to get that hug in me. That's going to get me in trouble and make me go where I don't want to go. In the case of a fish, it's going to pull it out of the water and to land. And that is not where that fish is supposed to be. So for you and I, living in sin is not where we're supposed to be. And so Satan, though, he's out there and he just keeps like tugging grab it. Come on, grab it. Come on, grab it. Now what happens the minute we grab it? Then all of a sudden now, Satan is that puppeteer, and he's like pulling the strings, and we're having because he's got us in that hook. And now, it becomes greater in a sense of transgression because now we are actively participating in that particular sin. And now, it begins to produce Fruit. Of course, it's bad fruit, but it's going to produce fruit. And over time, guess what? Do we not notice the leaves on the trees and the fruit on the tree? Does our eyes not go straight to that? That's what happens when we let intentional sin take root. And then all of a sudden now, it's producing fruit, but it's going to be fruit that everybody's going to see over time eventually. You know? Good example is, is if someone is maybe cheating on a spouse or something like that. At first it's in secret, it's in hiding, nobody knows about it. Let's just do it quietly, let's just do it at night, let's just do it on there. But then over time something happens because it becomes repetitive and now all of a sudden it, it's produced fruit. The leaves are out there and now it's this big old bush that now everybody is, did you see that, did you see that, did you see that, and then you can't hide it. What started as sin, as temptation, now is starting to be noticed. The thing about it is, is we can deal with this right here. Of course we can ask the Lord to forgive us. Of course we can say, Lord, I repent and I turn around from where I was and go back. But here's the thing. We opened a door for the enemy, for that spirit to be a part of our life. Remember we talked about you can't be possessed, but you can be what? oppressed or tormented and so we're repenting and the Lord forgives us but unless we deal with this with the, you know, with the Lord too to say Lord but not only do I ask you to forgive me but now Lord I need you to help me pull this fruit out because what will happen is I repent and then a month or two down the road here comes Satan throwing it back out again he starts pulling again, he starts pulling again, he starts pulling again, hoping I'm going to grab it, hoping we're going to grab it. 
Why is he doing that? Because we've still got something we haven't dealt with. And that is, Lord, I need that completely on my life. Since I opened that door, now Satan has a reason to torment me and oppress me and tempt me. So these are some of the things that we're going to talk about. So this, the, whole, the longer we debate the temptation, the more likely it is that we will give in to sin. Alright, so what is a generational sin, curse, or a generational pattern? Generational sins, curses, and patterns are what? They come out of attitudes, actions, beliefs, behaviors, and our habits that we have inherited from our family or relatives. We then enter into the same sin pattern or make it our own, like Pastor Keith was talking about. Maybe we're the ones starting these generational curses. It is usually repeated throughout our life as well as by individuals in successive generations. Here's a good example of generational curse. Anybody heard this? Oh, Grandpa had a violent temper. Dad had a violent temper. I guess I'm going to have a violent temper. Grandma had diabetes. Mama had diabetes. So I'm stuck. I'm going to get diabetes. Those are generational what curses. Those are the ones that have been passed down from generation to generation. Why? Because they were not dealt with with grandpa or great grandpa. They were not dealt with with grandpa, obviously, if they had the temper problem. And now it's on this generation. Now what are you going to do about it? Are you going to break it? Let the Lord help you break that so it doesn't carry down to your child, you know? But, but have we not heard that so many times growing up? We have. What has happened, even in, and I'm going to talk more about the body of Christ, because I know the world deals with that, but the body of Christ even, you know, not only doesn't realize necessarily about that happening, but accepts it, right? Well, you know, Grandpa had this problem, so did Dad, or so did his daughter, so I mean, hey, I'm doomed to have it. Do we have to do that? Do we have to accept it? No. But if we don't know any better, we just say, that's the way what? That's the way it is. Deal with it. But we don't have to because of who? Jesus. Because of who? Jesus. Jesus. He became the curse for us. So that when we deal with it, we do not carry it down to the generations after us. You understand, I want you to understand the importance of that because you and I can affect the lives of our children, our grandchildren, our great grandchildren. We can, with the help of the Lord, make their lives more blessed by what we do in our lifetime. And so, you know, with, with, especially like with Pastor Keith and I, you know, with our six sons and and all of them, we're like, Lord, you know, we will remain faithful to you, Lord, because you are faithful to us. And the Lord has told us many times, he said, because you are faithful to me, I will be faithful and watch over your children and your grandchildren. And we have one great grandchild. I will watch over them and protect them. And you cannot buy that. You cannot buy it. It's going to what? It's going to cost you something, though. What's it going to cost us? Obedience. And love of the Father. In obedience to Him. And that's what's going to break it. You and I have the key that Jesus provided to break those curses that they will not carry down to the generations to come. We have the key. But see, Satan has tried to, to destroy that to where the church doesn't even know that, not, to have that knowledge. To know that Jesus... What he did on the cross, we will never begin to find and understand and fathom the magnitude of him on that cross. The victory that came on that cross. Because I had, I, I had such a limited tunnel vision. Okay, Jesus died for my sins. And that's awesome. But he didn't stop there. He covered everything. And like I've told you before, remember when we studied the Old Testament, even the Jews, when they threw their children in the fire to mow it, when they threw their own children in the fire to worship that false god of Moloch, Jesus had to pay the price for every one of those sins. All the disobedience, 
even of the children of Israel. When they rebelled against God, turned their backs on Him, worshipped all these false gods and idols and this and that, Jesus had to pay the price for every one of those sins. And when you think about that, all the way even up here to today, what is yet to come, and Jesus took a lot on Him. Every sickness known to mankind, every mental sickness known to mankind, all of it, all of the curses. Can you imagine? No wonder the scripture said that he was marred so much that you couldn't even recognize him. Well, how could you when he had leukemia and AIDS and cancer and, and everything like the disease you could imagine that was not only on him and, and, and I'm sure that distorted his body too, but even the fact of all the beatings and and everything, and thinking about all the sin and all the rebellion of the people and all of that, the curses and just the occultic practices of the people, all of that sin was on him. We can't fathom what he dealt with. And yet he had a what? A nevertheless moment in the garden, knowing all of that was going to be on him. Nevertheless, Father, not my will be done, but yours. And why did he do it? Because he wanted to give the generations to come blessing instead of curses. And you and I now can give our children the blessings of God and not the curses of the enemy. Amen? Oh, I'm going to go there, but... Uh, Alright, All right. so what else is also tied to generational curses? Of course, familiar spirits. What are familiar spirits? Demonic spirits that are familiar with you and your family. This is not actually on your handout. Um, is there anybody in here that has an understanding of familiar spirits? And if you want to, you want to say what a familiar spirit is. Somebody? A familiar spirit is one that is studied that generation of people and he studied it to the point he realized how he come in and he began to do the right generation. It becomes very familiar. Yes, he's, it's a familiar spirit is a spirit that has become very familiar with your, let's just say, family. Okay, remember when I said, oh, Grandpa had a violent temper, Dad had a violent temper, I guess I'm going to have a violent temper. How did that even come about? Because that familiar spirit of violent temper, and there is, a, there is a spirit of violence, there is a spirit of temper, carried from generation to generation, very familiar with your family. Why do you think it is when psychic, when they go, people go to psychics, and then they tell them something Uncle Joe said and from the grave and all of that, which is necromacy. Necromacy is when you're speaking to the dead. But those familiar spirits, when you were there, are telling the spirits in that psychic what you need to hear. Why? Because they're familiar with your family. They're familiar with the history. And people, because of being naive and not understanding that, are like, oh my gosh, I went to this medium in the site, and they knew all about Aunt Jo and Aunt Jane and, and everything, and, and they knew all my history, and they knew this was that going on. Why, well, how did she know that? Because the familiar spirits told the spirits that are in that medium. And when you, a medium and a psychic, I guarantee you, has asked in probably tons upon tons of spirits. Demonic spirits. We don't have time to go into that, but they do. And so the spirits are talking and they're telling. And that's why some people think they, they, they get, you know, they don't understand. They think it's really Uncle Joe talking to them, but it's just the demonic spirit talking through them. Rebellion and anger for that person, even an adulthood, right, was up and 
control of the forbidden things that the Lord showed me this because we had been praying for this person and the things going on that he started my job story. And I never saw that before until the dream the Lord showed me where it began and how it began. Yeah, that's that how to pray for that person. It's a what we just know what we're going to know. He wants to know how to have a strategy on how to fight this spirit. Sure. Because we have to teach the parents because this is going to involve all of us to break this person free. What's just wrong with us? And that's what we're going to be talking about is how we can break those curses. Uh, but I've got two scriptures here. The first one, Leviticus 19.31. Once again, that's on your handout. Regard not them that have familiar spirits, neither seek after wizards to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. So one of the things that the Lord was telling the children of Israel, don't go seeking after wizards or mediums or psychics or the occult looking for answers. And that even includes horoscopes. And people are like, what? Yeah, that's horoscopes. Why? Because you're seeking your wisdom about your life from someone other than the Lord. It makes sense why the Lord said, I don't want you going to them, seeking out wisdom about your life, because the Lord says, you belong to me. Ask me. Ask my spirit. But he said, regard that not them that have familiar spirits, nor seek after wisdoms. To what? Because he said, you're going to be defiled by them. And then in Leviticus 20, verse 6, it says, And the person who turns to mediums and familiar spirits to prostitute himself with them, I will set my face against that person and cut him off from his people. Well, isn't that something how the Lord even used that word to prostitute himself with him? Well, we all know when we take the word prostitution, what is it? It's two people coming together intimately. He's even good to that point to say, you are intimately being spiritual with the kingdom of darkness. And God has a problem with that, and I understand that. And the person who turns to mediums and familiar spirits. Here's the, here's the sad and unfortunate thing. In the many years that, that uh, I have been doing counseling and things like that, you would be amazed how many Christians actually go to meetings, go to psychics, seek the occult, and they don't think anything about it. None at all. Why is it? Because it's lack of knowledge. It's just lack of understanding. Is it to, is it to condemn anyone? No. I, I read my horoscope when I was a young girl, and, and until I knew truth, and then I stopped, because I thought, you're right. Why am I seeking a fortune teller cookie to tell me how my day is going to be when I have God Almighty, Sovereign Lord, who orders my steps. See, it's all about where are we seeking, who are we seeking, what are we seeking. And so, familiar spirits, they're familiar with your family, they're familiar with the generations regarding your family, and so therefore, unless that's broken, unless it's dealt with, that's why, you know, you see it happening. You know, it, it just, it, it, and, it, and you're going to obviously see it way more than people that are in the world that are not believers. But unfortunately, it's even happening in the churches. Why? Because of the lack of knowledge and understanding. So, uh, generational curses, familiar spirits. You know, there's many, many more verses talking about familiar spirits. Uh, but I wanted to pull these two out just to say, I mean, the Lord even talks about them. And familiar spirits, once again, he, he puts them in a category with the mediums. He puts them in this category with the wizards and so forth. Uh, but he said, I will set my face against that person. And I thought, Lord, wow. You can tell what? The Lord just flat out doesn't like you. And uh, he wants us to seek him, not the kingdom of darkness, but the kingdom of light. All right. Let's look at what the Bible says about curses. Okay, Deuteronomy 5, 90 through 10 states, I do not leave unpunished the sins of those who hate me, but I punish the children for the sins of their parents to the third and fourth generation.
generations. But I lavish love on those who love me and obey my commands even for a thousand generations. Wow. God is telling you, I will bless your seed to a thousand generations if you do what? If we love him and obey him. I, in my case, Pastor Keith and I, because we're one and we're, we can determine our children down, and our, down to a thousand generations how their life is going to be based on what I do today. But also, if we choose to walk in rebellion and sin and disobedience, what am I doing? I'm leaving my children, my grandchildren open for the kingdom of darkness to torment them or to attack them or oppress them. For those familiar spirits to say, I have every right to be a part of their life. Here's the good news, though. Once we break those generational curses through the help of the Lord Jesus Christ, they're broken. And they will not care for them to their children. Thank you, Jesus. You see, Jesus became that curse. He had to take on the curse right there. When he said, I will punish the children for their sins and their parents. Jesus even had to take that sin on him. The sin of the parents for the children. Hours. When a person is sinned, that sin stands in need of being confessed. If a person doesn't confess it, then his children must confess it in order to break a generational pattern. Well, here's a good example. You know, let's just say, okay, I'll just use the example of maybe, okay, I'm a habitual liar, whatever. And so I think there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I'm be I'm a habitual liar. And I've never really confessed it because I don't think there's anything wrong with it. And now I have a child. And that child is, is uh, trying to walk with the Lord, trying to do right. But there's things going on, you know, that child probably figures, man, it always seems like I'm being attacked by Satan. And I don't know why I'm trying to walk with the Lord. I'm trying to do things without realizing that, that I have a confessed sin. And it's not that a child can can seek the forgive I mean the repentance of a parent because we all are sinners. We all have to we're all in need of a savior. I can't cover my father and my mother. I can't. But I can go to the Lord and say, Lord, on behalf of my mother and father, I ask you to forgive not only me, but Lord forgive me as part of this family that I have They had curses on them through things that they've done, their choices that they had. Now, we may not even know because you may have it to where you didn't know your parents or you didn't really know your grandparents or great-grandparents. And they may have done things in secret. And I may, you know, I may get a few faces, but Freemasonry, the Masons, wow, huge, huge curses that follow the families of people that are involved in the Masons and the Eastern Star. Because of the vows they speak over their children. They vow over their children and grandchildren, the lives and the souls of their children and grandchildren. But we don't have time to go into that. All right. But like an outstanding debt, the person's sin hangs out there, impacting his descendants until it is addressed through confession and cleared away. All right. We are not required to take responsibility for our ancestors' sins, but we are to acknowledge and confess their sin. We agree with God that they were wrong and that God was right. God asks us to accept responsibility for our own sin and to repent and be humble. Understand that the passing down of iniquity or sin is just that, the passing down of iniquity. My parents' sin does not become my sin, until I have made the choice to sin myself in the same way. Okay? But if I accept my parents' sin, uh, let's just say, for example, you know, a violent temper or hatred, racism, prejudice, things like that, 
How many generations did that come down? We all know several. You know, where you can hear sometimes, especially in the South, where they'll say, like, my great grandfather was in the KKK, or they were, had a lot of racism, hatred, prejudice, things like that. And so then, you know, father and son, and, and all the way down like that. There's a lot of that happening. Now, if it comes to the point where now I'm facing the Lord, and now I have to acknowledge that I sin because of racism, prejudice, or hatred, or whatever, I'm dealing with God on that for myself. But I can say, but Lord, I ask you, Lord, for the generations past that may have been involved in that or had that in their life. Lord, I just, I, I break that curse that it does not carry forth, not only into my generation, but my generations to come. Lord, that, that you hold that knot against me or my children, my grandchildren, for what my forefathers did. You can, you can do it um, to where it doesn't carry forth. You're not confessing the sin for them, but you're confessing that there was sin in the past of your family that you're acknowledging to God. God, I know that was wrong how they felt, how they, what they said, what they did. I know that was wrong, Lord, in your eyes. And as a family, I ask you to forgive my family. Right. For example, if my parents are alcoholics, it is not a sin in my life until I make the choice to begin drinking and become an alcoholic myself. Okay? Because I could choose not to, you know, say, look, you know, I didn't like the fact that my father or my mother was an alcoholic. I don't want that in my life. I'm not going to let it be a part of my life. And you can, if you are strong enough with the help of the Lord, say, I will not become and maybe because you detested the way you had to grow up in a home where there was an alcoholic in the home. And you can do that. All right. And that is one way, too, by saying, Lord, you know, I repent for, for my parents or grandparents that were involved in alcoholism and because of what went on in your home. But, Lord, I need your help to, to keep me to where I will not fall under that curse. Okay. I'm making a choice. I'm making the decision. It stops right here, Lord. I choose not to drink. I choose not to become an alcoholic. And therefore, I am not going to instill that in my children so they see me drink and think, well, mom drank. What's the big deal? She, she tell me not to drink. She drank. And so it just kind of just kind of snowballs. But the generational sin and curse pattern just means that I have a tendency to become an alcoholic to sin in this very same way that they have sinned. You know, that curse, generational curse is there. And what's Satan going to do? He is going to try to tempt you and entice you to do the same thing. Why? By saying, well, Grandpa was an alcoholic. Dad was an alcoholic. I guess I'm going to be an alcoholic. And you don't think twice sometimes about drinking. Well, it's in the genes. It's in the blood. It's in the, you know, and accept it. But we can read. It, right? And choose blessing instead of cursing of the curses. I hope this is all making sense. Y'all are quiet on me now. It is the same with manipulation, fear, control, anger, abuses. We don't even think about that. Fear. Let's think about that. Fear. You ever you know, heard about that where somebody said, man, my grandmother was afraid of everything I need. She wore all the lights on. She was afraid to go outside in the dark. She, you know, and it's like I'm talking intense fear. Anybody know somebody that's like that? I mean, they didn't talk an intense fear. And they have a fear. And then it carries down to maybe mom. And mom is like, you know, oh, don't do that. Don't do that. You can't do this. You're going to get me over here. You're going to have an accident. You can't do that. You're going to have. And that fear then is instilled even in, into the children. And they don't even realize it. You know, that fear that just carries down. Uh, but there is a spiritual pressure for me to commit the same kind of sins as my ancestors, as the curse from their sins pressured them in that direction. And so it's kind of like when I found this picture, I thought, well, it's kind of a good illustration because the black to me is those that fell under what I'll call the spell of the kingdom of darkness. They allowed that fear to take root. They allowed it to dictate their lives, their actions, their emotions, all of that. 
And here it is, you know, me standing here, you standing here, and we have a choice to make right now. You know, it's white because it's like, no, I don't want to do that. But are we going to keep them at bay, that sin, that, that, that curse of fear, or are we going to let it in over ours? There is a spiritual pressure, and there is, to commit the same thing. Satan just in your ear. Well, you're destined to. You're destined to because it's in the family. You're destined to. But fear is one thing that a lot of people don't think anything about. But it, it, it just it inflicts people to the point that they can't, they can't function freely because that fear is there because grandma and mom or whatever instill that fear in them on certain things. Right. A scriptural example can be found in Nehemiah 1, verses 4 through 11. But it says, Nehemiah receives word that Jerusalem is again in shambles, both physically and spiritually. This burdens his heart greatly, and he weeps for many days. And you're thinking, what does that got to do with this when the walls were torn down in Jerusalem the following year? In verse 6, Nehemiah cried out, I confess the sin that we Israelites including myself and my father's house, have committed against you. He is then granted permission to return to his homeland on a mission of restoration. All right, this happened when the, the children of Israel and the kings were disobedient. The kingdom was split. Then there was the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. The southern kingdom being Judah and Benjamin was the southern kingdom, and they made up Judah. And then the other ten tribes made up Israel. They were a split kingdom. Israel then used Samaria as their place of worship, where Judah used Jerusalem as their place of worship. But the kings in Israel's time, and I believe it was Hezekiah, don't quote me on it, Jehoiakim or Hezekiah, when he rebelled and he committed what, what God called fornication against him by worshiping false gods and allowing all these, these statues and, and these, uh, they called them um, groves and all this to be built for all these false gods, that was detestable to God. And so through their rebellion, what happened? God allowed King Nebuchadnezzar from Babylon to come and what? Conquer them, take them captive back to Babylon. And anybody remember how many years were they in Babylon? 70. 70. Yes. 70 years they were in captivity in Babylon. And in the meantime, what happened? Jerusalem was destroyed. The temple was destroyed. They took all the, all the uh, items out of the temple. And then the wall was destroyed. And now here Jerusalem sat unprotected. You, go, you hear me what I'm saying? Unprotected. Why? Because of the sin of the people. When we sin, intentional sin, it not only affects us, but it affects those around us. Not only our family, but I'm, what I'm saying, go with me on this, because it affected the whole group of Israelites, Jews, all around. For you and I, what is it? The church is struggling. Why? Because of the sin in the church. The walls are falling down. The walls are in need of repair to keep Satan and his demonic forces out of the church, to bring in the world, to bring in the things of the world into the church. What it's doing is tearing down the walls. And now they're getting into the temple to try to tear down the walls of the temple. Why? To leave the church vulnerable. You follow me? Generational curses, generational Things. And so Nehemiah, one man, Nehemiah, wept for the whole Israelite family. One man wept because he saw the ruins that were caused by what? The generational curses, the generational disobedience. And he wept for it. We should be weeping for the body of Christ. We should be weeping for the bride of Christ. We should be weeping for the church that has allowed the world into it to start tearing down the walls. And
And he's already torn down the walls. He's Satan's trying to now tear down the temple walls, which houses the very presence of God. Okay. So in Nehemiah 1, 3 and 4, this is what is said. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. When was the last time we sat down and prayed and fasted for the sins that are taking place not only in our lives, our families' lives, our children's lives, but in the lives of the church body as a whole? Verse 6. Please, this is Nehemiah crying out to the Lord. Please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night, for the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you, both my father's house and I have sinned. This is a very good example of breaking generational curses. He was crying out on behalf of his family. He said, well, for my father's house and for the whole children of Israel. That's a very good example of breaking generational curses and crying out to the Lord on behalf of them. What does that say for you and I? Take what me and I did and look at that and say, Lord, I am willing to pray. If you feel like the Lord's leading you to fast, to cry out, get on your face, get on your hands, get on your knees, and cry out for the sake of not only you, but the sake of those that are coming after you. But first, I need to deal with what happened before me. Lord, forgive me for whatever my parents and my grandparents might have done that was not only disobedience but rebellion against you and your work. Lord, I, 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 I'm not carrying their sin, but Lord, as a part of the family, I ask you to forgive my family because Lord, even you on the cross said what? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Jesus did it himself. Father, <coughs> forgive them for they know not what they do. And maybe our, our <coughs> forefathers didn't know what they, what they were doing, didn't realize what they were doing or allowing in their life. Father, forgive them. Forgive my, my past generations. Lord, but bless my future generations. Lord, I want to rebuild a wall that got torn down where it made my family vulnerable to the enemy. Vulnerable to the enemy's attack. Vulnerable to the enemy's schemes and curses. And so Nehemiah cried out on their behalf for himself, his family, and for the children of Israel. You are given a chance to stand before God and say, These things in my life and in the lives of my ancestors are sinful and destructive. Please forgive us, Lord. I want it to stop right here with me. Okay? That's what you can do. You cannot, you cannot forgive, you know, your father's sins have to be given, forgiven by the Lord by him confessing. But confessing isn't about casting blame. It's about starting and acknowledging the facts. The Bible makes it very clear that we have the power to either choose curses or blessing. We have the power to do that. In Deuteronomy 30, 19, it says, This day I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death. Who's talking right now? The Lord, right? Blessings and curses. Now listen what he said after that. The Lord said, Now choose life. Why? So that you and your children may what? He's given you the key. 
knee right there. Right there. He said, I set before you blessing and curses. But I'm telling you, God's saying, choose life. Why? So that you and your children may live. How much, we all know we love our children, do we not? We love our children more than we could probably ever express it. <clears throat> Let's love them enough to protect them and break those generational curses. And that's what we're going to do in these next few weeks. All right, next week what we're going to talk about is recognizing the curses, breaking the curses, and the price for generational curses has been paid. Because we're going to, and I covered a little bit of that about Jesus. But that's what we really want to cover next week. We're going to talk about how do I recognize there's a curse, and then how am I going to break it. All right, and I give you this quote. It's up to us to break generational curses. When they say, or when people say, all it runs in the family, you tell them, and this is where it runs out. Amen. 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 What's that saying we say? Not in my house and not today. It stops with you. This is where it runs out of my family. It's not going to touch my children and my grandchildren and my great grandchildren. It's not in Jesus' name. And all of this is done through what? The name of Jesus, by the blood of Jesus, and through his word. Amen? Amen. Oh, yes. And then I just gave you this um, for you just to have the last page. It's just frequently occurring generational sins. Here's a list of some sins and curses and things like that that people struggle with. Abandonment. Uh, abuse, mental, emotional, verbal, physical, sexual, <coughs> addictions, anger, rage, violence. I was talking about that, how they can come down to generations. Control, possessiveness, manipulation. That's another one, too. You ever heard that word? Man, grandfather was the most jealous man I've ever known in my life. And my dad, he was always so jealous of my life. What is that? It's a strong spirit, jealousy, because it comes with what? Insecurity. It, it comes with control. Emotional dependency, fears, touched on that. Idolatry, we touched on that. Greed, money extremes, not caring for children, parents, children exchanging roles. You ever seen that happen where you've got a dominating mother or a dominating father or, or they're exchanging roles where the children are have to raise the mother and the father and take care of them. And physical infirmities, pride, rebellion, rejection, insecurity, religious bondage and cults. Yeah, those that get tied up in cults. That carries down into generations too. Sexual sin, perversion, unbelief, unworthiness, low self-esteem, inferiority, and of course, definitely the occult carries down too. So this is a list of. And real quick, I just want to share real quick a testimony, um, then we'll end it. I had an aunt back in San Antonio. She was by marriage. Uh, her husband was my mother's brother. Uh, my brother, obviously, my mother, my, my grandfather was, a, I had, both my grandfathers were preachers. So he grew, he grew up in a Christian home, but he married this woman who was not a believer. This particular woman, she was known as, as in my hand, so I won't say her name. Uh, but when they married, they had struggles. He quit going to church, things like that. The children um, had a lot of struggles and issues. I mean, Three of them have already passed away, and, and there's just a lot that went on in that family. My cousin, their oldest son, became a deputy sheriff in San Antonio. And so he um, had that job. Well, my aunt passed away. Nobody knew. She had her own room. It was private. She kept the door shut and locked. Nobody went in there. She wouldn't allow anybody in there. Nobody <clears throat> knew what she did in there. She was just a very hard person to even be around. When she died, my, my oldest cousin went in there, was able to get in and broke into that room and found out that she had been a practicing Satanist and was involved in the occult. Did the hexes, hexes, curses, you know, I'm talking about like when you cut off hair and mm -hmm. chicken foot, that kind of stuff. Nobody knew that. Um, very secretive, she was very secretive. <clears throat> Three days before my cousin had come to my father 
brought to his house, and he said, I really feel like I can't rest until I talk to you. And he said, I want to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I feel like I need to do this. And my father said, of course. And so he led him in the sinner's prayer. He said to the Lord, he wept and cried. And he just felt beautiful, awesome. Three days later, my cousin was shot and killed when he pulled over a van. Him and his partner pulled over this panel van, a suspicious van. And they both went out on each side. And when they got up to the van, both the guys in the van had gun pointing out, and they both were shot and killed. Now, here's the thing. He accepted the Lord three days before, and he was saved. But between him being saved and between them being killed, my cousin, when he found out all that was in that room, he was so angry because he had just accepted the Lord. He grabbed all that stuff took it out of that room and went and had a barrel of fire and threw it all in there and was burning it all. Well, what do we figure happened? The demonic powers of darkness was so angry that he was, he was killed within three days. But praise God, he was saved mm -hmm. before. But see, we never did understand what was going on. Why was there problems with my cousins? You know? One of them already had three transplants. The one was always saying, it just a lot of like a dark cloud over them. And we used to feel sorry for them. We didn't know what was going on. But you see, the generation above them that had been practicing the occult, and it was detrimental to the children. And we didn't know it. And once that happened, when my cousin had all of that burn, yes, he was killed, you know, a couple of days later. But we know he's with the Lord, and that's the Lord's mercy and grace because we have been praying for him. And he was saying that he's with the Lord now. But I just wanted to throw that example out there. You really don't know. You don't always know what the generations past may have been involved in. But that's where when the Lord breaks those generational curses, you know, whatever they were involved in, when we ask the Lord to break that over us and all that, then that cannot carry forward to the generations to come.